Hi everyone, my name is Mark Hayes, and today I'll be doing a breakdown of this stylized sand material. This was created entirely in Substance Designer, and the render you can see right now is on the Marmoset tool bag. Some of the different steps I'll be covering today are the sand pattern, adding the rocks and stones, creating and adding the non-organic objects such as the horseshoe and bullet casings, how I blend all these elements together using the height maps, I'll be showing you how I added the colour to the material, and finally I'll be going over the exposed parameters. With all that covered, let's jump into Designer and take a look at the graph. Okay, so in Substance Designer, I'm going to quickly turn on Tessellation first of all. So to do that, you go to Materials, Default, Definitions, PBR, and then choose Tessellation instead of Parallax Occlusion. And I'm just going to drag all of these sliders up to the max. Now you can see we have much more depth in our material, and we can kind of see what's happening a bit more clearly. So onto the actual graph itself, you can see I have everything colour coded and labelled so that I can come back in later and make adjustments and easily know where everything is. Doing this just makes it a lot simpler to come back later on if you wanted to add extra items, say if I wanted to add some more stones or something like that. This makes it very simple to find out where everything is and if you wanted to hand this over to somebody else, it'll make their life a lot easier trying to find their way through your graph. To create the sound pattern, I used a mix of the splatter note with warp and directional warp notes. This will give us that wavy pattern. So the way it works is that we take our polygon 2 note and plug it right into the splatter note. So using polygon 2 will give us a nice gradient to the edges. So we see here, and we go down to my splatter note, I've increased the pattern size width all the way up. This kind of blends all of the polygons together. So we start bringing that down, you'll see it turns back into the individual polygon two nodes. But by bringing it up, they all start blending together much better. I've brought the rotation all the way down to here, so we get this nice horizontal line. I didn't want, or sorry, a diagonal line. I didn't want horizontal lines going through the material. I thought it just, just looked a bit more interesting. To give it a bit of variation as well, I put the size variation all the way up. So we can see what this looks like, it does nothing, it becomes very uniform. We don't we don't want that in the sand. As well as I've also brought up the luminance variation. Doing this just gives us a bit more depth to the material. So we can see here if we bring it all the way down, it becomes a lot flatter. Whereas if we just give that a bit of variation, suddenly we get a much more interesting, a much more a much deeper sand to look at. So to get those wavy lines current, we still have all these being perfectly straight. We're going to plug these into a warp node and then use the Gaussian 1 node as our gradient input. Doing this, you can see its effect right here. So you can see where these little spots are. That's where these white dots are going from. Doing this just breaks it up and gives us a start on these wavy non-uniform lines. And so by using the directional warp node, we again we just enhance what we've done previously and make it even less uniform and less predictable. So I've, I've used a linear gradient with its tiling up a bit and then I've blurred it to just soften this out. So you can see what kind of effect it has if I start bringing this down just starts to skew it and gives what I think is a much more natural looking sound. One of the issues that you run into at this point is that this is all still very very sharp. So by blurring all of it, it softens all of these dunes down a bit, brings it all together, makes it more cohesive. And it also just makes it not like just makes it not nearly as sharp. The final thing I did to actually get the height of the sand is to add little grains into it. So if we zoom in, you can start to see these. So to do this, I've just used two black and white spots nodes, blended together with screen, which just gives us all these tiny little dots. And then I blend that with the blur node that we had previously. 
Now I've used overlay so it darkens to darks and brightens to brights but I've set it to an incredibly low value of 0 0.02. That might seem a bit crazy like it'd have almost no effect but if we bring this down to zero you can see how much of an effect it actually has. Let's bring that back. I just find that that is about as much as I want for my stylized material. I don't want it to be super busy on the surface. Like if I start bringing this up, you'll start to notice how quickly it gets overwhelmed and just becomes too noisy. Even at something like 0 0.7, it starts to fall more into like a gravelly type material. Especially for stylized material, I want it to appear a bit softer. So 0 0.02 is about as high as I want to go with that. So onto the stones. Uh, as we're moving to the graph a bit more, you're going to notice that a lot of the different notes throughout the rest of it is plugged into this one Perlin noise. The reason why I'm doing that and only using the one instead of having a Perlin noise coming out of each of these different nodes is that I want to keep this nice and efficient. If I'm bringing this into other softwares, there's the chance that lots of noises will slow it down. They're quite computationally heavy. So by just using the one, it'll make things run a bit smoother in programs like Marmoset or in Substance Painter or whatever you want to use. But as for how I actually made the stones themselves, um, the first stone, which is the rounder one, is very, very simple. It's a polygon two node again. So we have that gradient. I've just brought up the sides from six to nine and brought up the curve a bit more just so it's a softer gradient and it's a bit smoother around the edges. I don't want to bring it up all the way. I still want some of these planes to be visible so that they can be affected later on. I then just pass these through a level and a histogram range to flatten it out a little bit if you leave it as it is at its base it'll end up being very very pointy so this almost just rounds it off a bit and brings it down in the actual material itself so if we zoom in here you can see what it looks like if we start playing with position of this gun range you notice it starts dropping down into the sand if we bring it up it pokes up more And all of this then is fed into this slow blur grayscale. This is a node you're going to be seeing used a lot throughout this, the rest of this video. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've the Perlin noise branched off so many times. So what we're doing with the slow blur, blur grayscale is we have our, we have it set to min. So what's happening is that we're taking chunks out of our shape. And we're creating all of these individual little planes and all of this little detail that can be then utilized by both the color map later on and the height map to make the stones appear a bit more natural and a bit more roughed up. And the same thing is true for the second type of stone. This went through a slightly different process because I wanted a different shape. Uh, so we started off with a shape node with disc. I played with the size a bit just to get this elongated disc shape. And then I plugged that into a warp node. Again, use the lighting utilizing this Perlin noise to break up this edge, make it more uneven. The next thing I do is I bring this into a bevel node. Now the reason for this is that when you're using tessellation and a height map, what can end up happening is that if you have this hard edge here, you get distortion between the different levels of the grayscale. So if this was just white all the way around, can actually show you so if I just plug that in here you start getting this awful distortion here by beveling it before we do that it softens the gradient and creates a smoother transition from whatever's below it to this stone next up I'm just feeding it into a levels node so that we don't so that we aren't hitting that pure white value anymore I want to be working off grays at this point. I don't want to be maxing out the possible height information that I can have. The next part here is where I use my this linear gradient. This is to create the angle effect. So by 
overlaying a linear gradient top using multiply. It creates this slope so it looks like the sand is the uh, stone is poking into the sand or coming out from it and just gives it a bit more a bit more detail compared to the round one and it gives a bit of variation to the material throughout. So you can see there's points where it's only barely poking out or there's ones where it's almost completely out. Next we have another slope or grayscale. So this is using the same perlin noise. I've just used a transform 2D node to rotate the perlin noise a little bit. This is because when we used our warp node earlier with the same perlin noise you ended up just it almost just enhanced what the warp was doing and by rotating it we get a bit more random effect. So again we're creating all of these new planes to give a bit of interest throughout the stone itself. Finally plugging that into a levels node just to bring it up a little more so I was a bit heavy handed with the previous grades but that allowed us to get all of this detail in the slope blur. Bringing into levels and bringing all those grade values up just a bit. It also brings out some of these really deep things that the slope blur did so if we look in here and in here you can see that it's gone very very dark and I'm worried I was worried about these distorting if I was using tessellation so I putting into a levels node it just softens this out again. When it comes to actually scattering them around the sand what I've used is I've used the tile sampler so you can see here the x and y amount are set to be exposed and I'll cover that at the end of the video uh, but for the pattern I've set the pattern input to 2 so that I can include both of the different types of stones and then I've just randomized a couple of the different options here. You can see here I've got the scale random set up. I've got some random rotation as well. So by setting all these values it just starts breaking this up a bit and making it look like they're not placed in any sort of ordered fashion. The most important part about this though is using the mask random. Uh, this is again exposed, but this is what creates this random distribution of them. I'll cover again that later on when I'm exposing the parameters, but just keeping in mind at this point that that's going to be something very important.